to It gives me great pleasure to uh, say hi to Nino Jordan, who is the Class of the Sustainability Fellow this year. Um, first of all, congratulations, of course, on this fellowship, and we're absolutely delighted that you could find the time to be with us and to share your research. Um, the fellowship, of course, the fellowship program of the Institute is an integral part of what we do here, and our focal topic, Justice and Sustainability, sort of focuses broadly uh, in a cross-cutting way, and it draws together, it attempts to do so at least, all of the justice-related aspects of the individual products, the projects that everyone is doing at the Institute. And in that respect, we sort of try to push people to think about what the justice aspects are of the research. And then we invite people from time to time to speak in our public lecture series, um, and we're absolutely delighted, you know, that you are here. Uh, the details of Nino's presentation you would have seen um, in the advertisement and uh, in the invitation. But very briefly, as I said, Nino is the Klaus Tipper Fellow for this year. Um, and his project focuses on um, ways to accelerate learning, specifically on carbon footprint policies, which I think is a super innovative field of study. Um, coming from a lawyer, so uh, it's 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 certainly much more interesting, I think, than the sort of work that I do. <laughs> um, and um, we'll certainly also hear some of these elements in your talk today. Uh, Nino is currently on leave. Um, when he's not here, he's associate professor um, in resource efficiency, circular um, economics, um, and program lead of the MSc in sustainable resources. Economics, Policy, and Transitions at the University College of London Institute for Sustainable Resources. And more broadly speaking, Nino's research focuses on the governance of embodied emissions and carbon footprint policies. I hope you'll also say something about your understanding of embodied emissions, um, which would be super interesting. Nino, over to you. Um, You've got time for a presentation, and afterwards we've got some time for Q and A. Thank, Thank you so much, Louis, for inviting me, for having me here today, and I'm very excited to give this lecture. And um, it has stimulated a lot of thinking about it. I've been meaning to think more deeply about the environmental justice dimension of this topic, anyway. So this has really been a, a good um, stimulation for now, and um, so I'm, I'm presenting my preliminary thoughts on the topic and I've invited some some other people online as well um, who, who will hopefully also and, and everyone I hope you will uh, give me good feedback help me to develop my thinking more um, so this is really for me uh, a really a good good point in time to talk about these issues um, so I call this inescapable dilemma so there are tensions between different aspects when we try to tackle global climate change and we try to make climate change mitigation policies more ambitious to scale them up to, to spread them all, all, out over, all over all over the globe basically um, and here i focus on carbon footprint policies which seek to target the emissions embodied in global supply chains so not just focusing on the emissions within a country, not just focusing on the emissions from industrial facilities, but really trying to also take into account to, to regulate emissions, to regulate or to price the emissions um, that are so-called embodied or embedded in the products that we are importing into in, in countries. Mm -hmm. um, and this is particularly important from a industrial competitiveness perspective, which means it's important from a political economy perspective. And here we already have this uneasy tension between, oh, we talk about political economy, but also about climate justice. And often that is done in very distinct ways. So we will have, an, we will have some connection between critical political economy and climate justice, but not so much in terms of the political economy of how you get policies passed, how you get really things done in climate justice. Mm -hmm. So these seem these discussions are tend to be quite disconnected. 
Uh, so I'm trying to connect those a little bit um, in this in this presentation today. So I'll start with defining what I mean by carbon footprint policies, then talk very broadly about climate justice. Um, then I will talk about why climate policies that only target industrial producers in the global north are, are less effective, why it's a problem if you only focus on that. Um, then I introduce the concept of carbon leakage and talk about various instruments intended to counter the phenomenon of carbon leakage. So I'm, ex I'm going to explain what I mean by carbon leakage, what are the different instruments, and there has been a lot of novelty in terms of the in instruments available recently. So, so that's, that's very interesting, not directly related to climate justice, but then we are, I'm going to delve deeper into that and look at the different justice implications of these different policies. Mm. Could I just briefly interrupt you? Sorry, uh, Bernardo just notified me. You've not shared your slides, apparently. Apparently, it's not visible. Uh, that's very interesting because it's visible on the big screen. That is, that is what we see. Screen. Um, so maybe I'll have to... Um, that shouldn't be a huge problem. We, we can also continue if... Interesting zoom back. Um, just share screen. It's a shame. It's working now. Is it? I think he just says it's working now. The presentation? Yeah. Um, so I think you can just proceed. Which one? Um, Bernardo, are you seeing the table of contents now? So the overview. Bernardo, are you seeing the overview slide now? Yeah, we can see the overview. It's not in presentation mode, but we can see the, the slide. Okay. That's the best thing I can do. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Okay. okay. So, um, so then I'm going to briefly address the, the cross border economic impact of border carbon adjustments. So have a look at some, some of those studies. Um, so, and then I'm looking at an interesting dimension, which is that border carbon adjustment or pricing in general, whole economy carbon pricing seems more neutral, um, but actually the political economy of standard setting is much more promising. Um, mm -hmm. Then I'm going to look at the ability of different carbon footprint instruments to accommodate uh, the common but differentiated responsibilities uh, demanded by climate justice. Um, and also to look at what these policies force onto other countries. Um, so also a little bit provocatively, I'd ask if uh, carbon footprint policies may even be just, maybe just even when opposed by the global south. And, and just as a kind of like postscriptum, um, I think it's also important to look at um, um, carbon footprint policy is not just enabling protectionism, but also enabling market creation. 
and that can also be, be problematized from a climate justice perspective. Mm -hmm. And then I'll, I'll just summary, summarize the main points. So let's look at carbon footprint policies. So I define carbon footprint policies as policies taking into account at least some of the upstream carbon footprint of a product that means the embodied or the uh, embedded emissions. Um, so here you see the operational emissions, which we usually try to target with climate mm -hmm. policy, for example, heating, electricity consumption, or um, emissions, industrial emissions. Uh, so we look at the operational emissions for vehicles. We try to make vehicles more, more efficient or, or change them to use electricity use and so on. But when we look at um, international trade, if we if you look at international trade and we want to address uh, the emissions embodied in international trade, caused by international trade, then we also need to target the embodied emissions, for example, from raw material extraction, transport, manufacturing, uh, further transport, and, and the construction, for example, of buildings. So we also need to address those emissions. And there are different ways which we can use to do that. For example, pricing, we can say, hey, we don't only price the emissions within a country, but we also price the emissions associated with the products that we are importing. And usually that's in the form of border carbon adjustment saying, okay, we have a carbon price here, any, and we want to level the carbon, the carbon price for imports coming in. So we want to make sure there's a level playing field. There can also be non-pricing instruments such as maximum carbon thresholds for certain products, for example, you could regulate the uh, emissions, uh, the, the whole life cycle emissions of a car, including the battery, and not just not just the, the operational emissions during when, when while you're running the car. And there can also be hybrid policies when you say, okay, maybe we cannot mandate the maximum life cycle impact of a car, but what we can do um, is at the country level, for example, we can change the tax. We can change a tax band in accordance with the life cycle emissions of a car. So we have those pricing, non pricing, and hybrid policy. Mm -hmm. um, so let's briefly recall what one could consider as essential parts of climate justice. So, from a climate justice perspective, climate policy, climate action needs to take into account the historical responsibility for greenhouse gas emissions on the one hand, but also um, how different countries or different groups have economically benefited from the greenhouse gas emissions, from the process associated with the greenhouse gas emissions over time, and how that has also accumulated over time, that uh, relative benefit. And climate justice requires measures that redress injustices and do not perpetuate them. So, and, and this is a, a big ask if we look at the interest behind the promotion of certain climate policies and, and how we try to tackle climate change. Um, how, how do we do it in a way that can redress these injustices but, and, and doesn't perpetuate um, these injustices? <clears throat> um, so, but there is a, a tension between climate justice and policy effectiveness. For example, you could say <clears throat> over the global north, uh, to put it in simple terms, has has caused most of the of the pollution, so they should clean up. I'm their sorry to interrupt. I guess. Yeah. Um, so so the global the global north should basically clean up uh, their act and and not bother anyone else uh, with with uh, any any uh, demands to, to change their ways, right? Mm -hmm. um, but what we have in, in practice is a problem of carbon leakage. So if we have ambitious climate policy instruments, they increase costs for industry. Um, those, in those instruments could be carbon pricing, emission standards, or renewable energy subsidies. And if, if that results in increased costs, it can also lead to um, competitiveness losses or relocation of industry. Um, so basically emissions might occur somewhere else. They, the emissions might just move somewhere, either because industry relocates or because 
the demand relocates. So we would get our uh, carbon intensive products from, from other places. Um, so that causes resistance from affected industries, but it also delegitimizes those measures because if we just end up importing from other countries, which are less, which have le a, a lower level of climate policy ambition, if at all, then it counteracts the whole purpose of these climate policies. Um, because the idea was behind them that you would actually mitigate emissions, that you would cut emissions, um, but in the worst case, they could just be re relocated. So it's an industry narrative, this threat of carbon leakage, but at the same time, if because we haven't really applied very um, ambitious climate policies so far, it's, uh, it's a very real possibility as well. Mm. Uh, so the main approaches to countering carbon leakage so far have been leniency on production-based emission standards, so the regulatory freeze, so we are not really being very demanding in terms of producers really cutting down on uh, on the carbon emissions. Um, we are giving out free allocate, we are, we are freely allocating emission permits, so industry in the European Union gets most of the emission permits for free. Mm -hmm. Um, so the carbon price, if you look up the carbon price and you see, oh, wow, the carbon price has increased quite a bit, it's getting some bite, it's illusory because industry gets most of those perm emission permits for free anyway. So it works in the energy sector where you don't get those free emission permits, but even there you also get uh, energy subsidies, right? So you get exemptions for industry from paying the full electricity price, for example. Um, that reduces energy efficiency incentives, but and also places more burden on consumers and public finances, uh, and can also make this this policy quite um, unpopular. So there is a limit uh, up to which extent the population is going to accept such price hikes, particularly in the current uh, inflationary climate. Um, so the main approach is discussed. Uh, currently for countering carbon leakage are unilateral border carbon adjustments, for example, the European Union's so-called car carbon border adjustment mechanism, the CBAM, which is basically requires from importers to also obtain emission permits uh, for the products they bring into the European Union. And, and the idea is that over time we will increase the number of permits they need to, to obtain, and we will decrease the free allocation of emission permits for domestic industry, so that in, in 10 years or so, we will have uh, a level, level, this kind of level playing field, and we won't, and we will have proper carbon prices installed. So that's the idea, but they're also only starting with a couple of sectors, um, and there are potentially lots of problems where I mean, we haven't really explored, we have we, we don't really know how it's going to play out in practice yet. And there, there's also the idea of carbon clouds. Sorry, we, can, we, we cannot see the presentation. We cannot. Okay. What can you see? So the... We can see only um, the first slide of some PDF document. It is slide two of carbon footprint, just the September 2023 RIFS PDF. I think, you know, if we're not going to sort this, if you're happy just to proceed without the slides, then perhaps we should do that. Are you happy with that? Um, yeah. Okay, so um, we will most probably, apologies for the uh, technical glitch in sharing the slides, uh, we will just proceed without them. Thank you, Nino. Um, Thanks. <clears throat> so, um, 
Let's look at uh, unilateral border carbon adjustments. For example, the European Union CBAM, it's promising in, in principle, but it's quite complicated. And also what's important here from a political economy perspective, something like a border carbon adjustment can only be uh, passed, can only be implemented by the political unit that governs the tariff border. For example, the, Euro the European Union and now the United Kingdom or the United States of America, but not California. So the more rich, progressive jurisdictions like Denmark and California they don't have the power to, to impose that. And that means that you will always have the veto players who are less rich or more codependent or whatever, who uh, could be in the way of ambitious border carbon adjustments or an ambitious carbon price. That's the general problem um, with carbon pricing, including border carbon adjustments. Uh, you can do carbon pricing uh, in California, for example, at the subnational level, but you cannot also implement a proper border carbon adjustment. So it's it's very it's a very high level solution. So that's not very nimble in that sense. And of course, it also relies on carbon pricing, which is currently not feasible in the United States at the federal level. Um, and it relies on the homogeneous carbon price across the economy. So that makes sense from a market liberal perspective. It's supposedly technology neutral, cost efficient. You get the low-hanging fruits first, uh, you avoid the pork barrel politics, a lot of lobbying and so on for special favors. You avoid that. Um, in, in theory, in, in, in practice, because of all these problems with we don't have border carbon adjustment and so on, because of all these international trade problems, in practice, you get lots of these, uh, these lo this lobbying again. But in theory, it, it's less problematic from that perspective than having in this technology specific standards, right? So that's the general idea. Um, but it doesn't make much sense from a political economy perspective because it might be better to go for the sectors where resistance is low, um, where you, you can, where, where, the, where there are more progressive actors and so on. The problem is then because you have economy wide carbon pricing. Uh, someone is gonna. Someone will have a more of a problem with a high carbon price. One one industry or the other, one big corporation or another, and they they have huge interest in blocking ambitious policy, and so that's a big problem with having this big umbrella policy uh, where you try to coordinate. Where you have a homogeneous carbon price across the whole. So it also doesn't make much sense from a technology forcing perspective because in order to reach 1.5 degrees uh, or not, not go beyond that, uh, you may want to have quicker action. Uh, you want to more radically accelerate, in this, uh, accelerate the decarbonization of industry and you don't want to just rely on, oh, let's go with the cheapest options first and so on, right? So it's a, it's a very different perspective. Uh, so targeted instrument mix can more effectively force technological change than just bland whole economy pricing. Um, carbon clubs, the original version of it was to basically have an, an alliance of different countries, relatively high carbon ambition, and then have a tariff barrier uh, against the outsiders. So that was the original idea by, by William Nordhaus, uh, Nobel Prize winning economists from Yale um, and the German government as part of the G7, um, the G7 presidency has taken up the idea, has said, oh, this actually sounds like a good idea, but then lots of people say, okay, but it's quite offensive to many countries of the global south, it could be quite alienating. In the current situation, this could actually deepen the potential rift in the global trading system. And then now people talk more about a kind of a nicer club where you encourage each other and there's some financing here and there. So the, the, this idea of the carbon club, the original idea has become quite diluted and watered down. So we're not discussing this here, what that could mean. And now there are some alternative instruments, more bottom-up more bottom instruments. For example, green public procurement, targeting embodied and life cycle emissions, the most famous case in California, where the Bike Green California Act now stipulates that the federal government, that the, that the California state government can only buy certain building products, for example, steel, when that, if they are below 
uh, sort of threshold. So it's not super ambitious. It's just uh, it should just be better than the average. But it's but it's something. It's quite um, quite important that they've introduced that. And there are now in the, there's also interest by the federal government now in uh, also introducing those procurement criteria. There's uh, four billion of spending foreseen in the Inflation Reduction Act to support companies with labeling efforts. So um, there's a lot of money in that. Um, then there are mandatory embodied or life cycle um, carbon performance standards. Um, you could introduce those for intermediate products, for, for, some, for example, steel and cement. So it could be an extension of something like Bike Clean California, where you say, okay, it's not just the government that says we won't procure anything above a certain threshold, but we basically take all those products off the market. We could say we take the most polluting steel off the market and so on. It's The British government has, um, has included that in some consultation questions, which was interesting. So there was some thinking about that as a potential option and it would be an interesting, it would be an interesting option for utilizing some of the freedoms that have won by leaving the, the European Union to actually say, hey, now we've got some more liberty here. We're not part of the, of the single market anymore. Maybe we could do something like that. <clears throat> then also final products. Um, Denmark uh, and France have maximum, maximum thresholds for the uh, life cycle emissions of buildings now. So it's not just operational emissions, and not, it's not just energy efficiency, but also the emissions embodied in the building materials that count to the uh, um, efficiency standards now. Uh, California uh, wants to introduce something similar uh, now. So if, if California moves, then it's likely that uh, other states in the United States are also going to move. So that's very interesting. And steel is also is not just important in construction, steel is also important um, for vehicle construction. And um, as I already mentioned, one could uh, differentiate uh, vehicle tax rates in accordance with life cycle emissions. But what's really important now, just in June, June or July of this year, the European Union passed the battery, the battery regulation, a revamp of the battery regulation, which forces the introduction of uh, maximum carbon thresholds for batteries as well, mm -hmm. which is quite uh, of strategic, potentially of strategic importance for the, for the European automobile sector, uh, which fears a lot of uh, competition from Chinese uh, EV producers, electric vehicle producers. So what's interesting about the Bike in California Act, that part of the narrative here, and this is it's really interesting, so there was a, this alliance of trade unions and environmental uh, organizations very much promoted this policy. And it the narrative is that they built a bridge in California and the Californian steel, which was more tightly regulated than the Chinese steel, uh, wasn't competitive. So the bridge was built with Chinese steel. Hmm. Uh, so that's part of the narrative. So there is something already kind of protectionist in this Buy Clean California Act. It's not just the Buy Clean Act, it's also the Buy Californian Act, right? Hmm. So, <clears throat> so one can see this very critically, but one can also see it in a productive way at least there is this protectionist intent, at least it gets some more ambitious climate policy going. Um, yeah, so there's the EU battery regulation that was just passed a couple of months ago. Um, so this should be important, independently of where the battery is produced, right? So it's supposedly neutral, it's not supposed to be with protectionist intent, but by, 20, 20, by 2031, there will be an analysis of the impact of this regulation on the competitiveness of the battery sector. So, of course, so this is independently of where the batteries are produced, but it would be very difficult to imagine a really, really ambitious battery regulation if it was very much to the detriment of the EU industry. And it's far from clear that a very ambitious 
better regulation will necessarily benefit uh, the European car producers or the European battery producers, because obviously now maybe, okay, we can see the Chinese battery production relatively dirty, but maybe they will be quite far to cleaning up the act. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting, but it also shows us this, this uh, melange between protectionist intent and, um, and the, uh, and, and, support for novel, more ambitious climate policies. So, um, so some people have analyzed um, the implications of border carbon adjustments for, for different countries around the world. So I get all examined two uh, CBAM scenarios, one only targeting energy intensive trade exposed sectors which would be a near-term solution so you only focus on the sectors that are energy intensive which need to pay high carbon prices basically uh, where it's very, very relevant um, and which are very trade exposed so where you have a big problem of carbon leakage or a large potential for leakage right or you could apply to all imports so that's the potential future broadening because the more, if you really try to reach net zero, then you also need to uh, take into account more innocuous uh, products, right? Um, so in both scenarios, they have found high risks observed in African countries in Southeastern Europe. Other studies also identify Russia, China, Turkey, the United Kingdom, Ukraine, Korea, and India as major affected trade partners. And now, if we compare border carbon adjustments to maximum carbon footprint thresholds, then it makes it also makes sense for carbon footprint thresholds for intermediate products such as steel to first only target the energy intensive trade export sectors. But then, if you talk about downstream carbon footprint thresholds, for example, for buildings or for vehicles, then it would need to apply to nearly all used intermediate products. Because otherwise, it's very difficult to say, okay, we're, we're looking at the whole life cycle here, right? Because you might have a lot of product substitution and so on. So um, it's, it's quite problematic. Maybe there can be like some hybrid options where you just you just say, you just pragmatically just focus on the steel content of a car or you just look at the battery and so on. But um, if you really want to focus on the whole life cycle and you have this very holistic perspective, then you draw more and more products in there potentially. And, and if we look at cars, it's a very highly complex product. So um, I think it's when we, when we look at climate justice, uh, I think it's very important to differentiate in between intentions and impacts, and what, that's what, what's usually being done in justice discussions. Um, so both, both are important. Uh, we cannot just say, oh, we had a good intention. Um, we, we, it was well intended, but you had all these negative impacts, and we haven't looked into those impacts before to be, because we just had this good intention, right? Um, but at the same time, if you have a protectionist intent from the beginning, why we pass those policies, then it's probably going to be perceived in a very different ways from, from the countries uh, or from the people who are subjected to those policies, right? Mm -hmm. So we have those different intents. We've got the intents of protectionism, policies aimed at shielding domestic industries from foreign competitors, and also decarbonization. So there can be broader goals, more universalist goals, without necessarily having protectionist interests. And when we look at the politics that actually gets the policies passed, we're likely to see this melange of different you know, interests and values. Um, and that's something which the political right in the United States, the anti-regulation, uh, uh, and the anti-regulatory right very much um, exposes we have this talk about Baptist bootleggers coalitions, strange bedfellows, and so on. So they, they again and again look at environmental policy and say, hey, you have those, 
you pretend that you're so saintly and you only have these environmentalist intents, but you're really in bed with these industrialists who want to use the want to benefit from higher regulation to bring mom and pop shops out of business and then just um, have, ex use their monopoly power and so on. So you, you have a lot of this, this analysis, um, but used in a way to generally um, cast regulation of that light. But it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean just because they are they use it to cast regulation of their light. It doesn't mean that it's not a thing. So that's also really, that's also important. Um, so if you look at pricing versus standard setting, there's, uh, we have the political economy, which is very much in favor of standard setting um, and whether it's the perceived neutrality of carbon pricing. So if you look at, um, the if you look at the ease of use for protectionist intent, then if you have economic-wide carbon pricing and border carbon adjustments, it's quite difficult to really find the right price to maximize your protectionist uh, benefits from it. So it's the same, that's, it has a certain neutrality, comes across as neutral. Um, this is also why, um, why neoclassical economists tend to favor it, you have less of this uh, pork barrel politics and so on, domestically, but also internationally. Mm -hmm. um, but if you have product-specific carbon tariffs, like what's under discussion between the United States, the United Kingdom, and the European Union now, when it comes to the steel sector, obviously, protectionist intent, uh, it can be very easy use with protectionist intent. Um, Maximum carbon thresholds for intermediate products, just the same. You can say, okay, steel, European steel products have this uh, carbon intensity, Chinese steel products that, let's put it just there so we benefit, benefit optimally from it. When it comes to final products, such as cars or buildings, it's much more complicated. So it's, it's much lower the ease, of protect, the, the ease of use for protectionist intent. Because you don't really know once you set those thresholds how the building sector is going to evolve, uh, what solutions are available, and so on. Um, if you look at the number of veto players from different industries that may potentially block ambitious policy here, for economy wide carbon pricing and border carbon adjustments, very high. If you look at product specific carbon tariffs, it's low. If you look at maximum carbon thresholds for intermediate products, it's also low because this is just could be just be done in coordination between the steel sector and the European Union, for example. Um, maximum carbon thresholds for final products. I'm not so sure. It's quite complex to think about it because you have all these different suppliers uh, in when it comes to construction and particularly when it comes to cars. So it's quite complex. Um, so, but if you look at the number of veto players across the regions that could potentially block ambitious policies, it's quite high when it comes to carbon pricing. It's also high when it comes to product-specific carbon tariffs, because mind you, that is the tariff border. Uh, so you need to get different countries on board. Um, also carbon thresholds for intermediate products. There are also lots of veto players because that affects the internal market. Um, Cars, if you use non pricing measures, that's a standard. There's also, you have lots of veto players. <clears throat> but if you introduce hybrid measures, differentiated tax rates, you could do it um, at the level of Denmark. You don't need to wait for the European Union mm -hmm. because the, that, that, is, that is part of that is You can do that at the country level. <clears throat> and also for buildings, you can also regulate buildings at the country level, or you, could, you can do it at the level of California. So you have these advantages here when it comes to political economy. Um, and you with all these other options, you have lots of proximity to the border. So people think of it in terms of trade issues quite quickly. But um, if you look at buildings, that's, that's pretty low. So you're quite far away from the border in that sense. So that's it's also an advantage for this, for this kind of policy. So just a very rough sketch of the problem structure. So 
if you can ally the national economic interest behind climate policies, you're more likely to get ambitious climate policies and good climate policy effectiveness. Um, you will also get more if you if you manage to design equ equitable policies, which can be accepted around the globe, you're also likely to get more climate policy effectiveness if, you, if it's considered more legitimate. But there is conflict, a tension between uh, international equity and the pers pursuit of the national economic interest. This is just a very, very rough sketch. So unfortunate, or maybe it's fortunate for me that the people at uh, home cannot see the simplicity of this. <laughs> um, so if you just look at the national level, um, the problem is how can we adopt more ambitious policies? And here just focus on, on maximum carbon footprint thresholds and the regulatory standards. So we may harness protectionist domestic industry interests to get this policy past this policy, but then from a climate justice perspective, it results in a disadvantage for exporting countries with less historical responsibility and a potentially a lower ability for low carbon production. If we now look at the international level, so the problem is how do we actually provide incentives for low carbon production around the world? Um, so these maximum, so these regulatory standards taking embodied carbon into account in industrialized countries, they provide incentives um, for low carbon production in other countries. Um, but from a climate justice perspective, those incentives for low carbon production are also externally imposed. Mm -hmm. And if we look at the international level, again, how can we actually make sure that technologies become available and be, become widely and quickly adopted, um, then we may find some business opportunities um, for transnational corporations and foreign direct investment. So that could be a way of harnessing the economic interests to diffuse those technologies to make them widely available, but that would also perpetuate the economic dominance of the global north. So now let's look at some let's, of the supposed ability of instruments to accommodate the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities. So often it is said in favor of border carbon adjustments that uh, in principle you could have revenue recycling. So you could take part of the revenue from carbon pricing and redistribute it to uh, importers, to importing countries to make up for their relative competitive losses perhaps, so perhaps that could be, become part of climate financing and so on. So there in principle, there's a revenue recycling possible, whereas with maximum carbon footprint thresholds, there's no, no, not really money involved in that sense. There's no revenue, so you cannot recycle anything. But if you look at the actual CBAM implementation, it doesn't foresee any revenue recycling. And you could, in principle, what's also set in favor of carbon pricing and border carbon adjustments is that you can apply it in a differentiated way. So you could give a discount to developing countries um, in principle. But the question is whether that would be WTO compliant. Mm -hmm. And you could also say the same for about maximum carbon footprint thresholds. You could also say, OK, we're being a bit less strict, a bit more lenient with developing countries imports question is, would that be WTO compliant? And also, if the, that margin was sufficiently high, if the discount is sufficiently high, you differentiate a lot, then you could invite carbon leakage again. So that's, that's problematic. Um, and now let's look at what implementation of these policies actually forces onto other countries. If you have border carbon adjustments, it penalizes importing countries for not having implemented carbon pricing themselves. Because if they haven't implemented carbon pricing, it means the European Union is going to ask the importers to purchase emission permits, and that money is going to stay with the European Union. So there is some pressure to for those 
importing countries or the exporting countries where the stuff comes from to also impo uh, impose carbon pricing just to make sure the money actually stays in their own pockets. So that's part of the idea that actually, or we introduce border carbon adjustments and will actually produce incentives, produce certain incentives for other countries to also adopt similar policies. But then the question is, I mean, that's an approach the United States has particularly been pushing for a long time, carbon pricing, they're not, they're not able to implement it at home at the national level, the federal level. So we're not quite sure whether it's the optimal policy, but we basically provide the very strong incentives for adopting it somewhere else. So in comparison, maximum carbon footprint thresholds do not penalize countries for that, for the absence mm -hmm. of carbon pricing. It's, uh, that's pretty neutral. It's not about whether someone has paid a carbon price, it's just about the carbon content, the embodied carbon content of a good. Um, so both border carbon adjustments and maximum carbon footprint thresholds require de facto surveillance of carbon emissions abroad. We somehow need to track them through supply chains. So that could be seen as quite problematic. Um, but then border carbon adjustments also require surveillance of carbon prices paid abroad in contrast to maximum carbon footprint thresholds. And this is not, it's not just the prices paid abroad, but you will also want to make sure there are no weird cross subsidies, which kind of put the carbon price uh, at absurdum, right? So you want to make, because you could imagine lots of schemes, which basically return the carbon price paid somewhat to the producers so that they can stay competitive and can um, undercut their less carbon intensive competitors. Um, and both, both schemes penalize importers for not being able to provide a proper carbon footprint declaration. So if we compare the both schemes, we can say both force something onto other countries if they want to import into the jurisdictions that adopt those carbon footprint policies. But maximum carbon footprint thresholds, regulatory standards are actually imposed less onto other countries than, than border carbon adjustment. And so that is more in line with the autonomy considerations of climate justice. Um, so now a little bit, um, it's a bit provocative. It's very unfortunate that the people at home cannot see the graph here. Uh, so there might be arguments in favor of applying carbon footprint policies, even against opposition from the global south. Um, because if we look at the sovereign, because we could see that sovereignty within the international system um, is also instrumental for a de facto system of interdependencies and domination for international economic competition. So it's a, it's a specific structure that, that brings us to try to undercut each other and to which incentivizes uh, to incentivize to uh, the emission uh, carbon emissions. But then, of course, um, political independence and self determinations are key conditions for the realization of international justice. One could also argue that the representatives of the global south are likely to be from a class with high carbon footprint themselves, and uh, that you're not really that the interlocutors are not really necessarily the people who suffer most from climate injustice, mm. but well, but then there are similar patterns in the global north as well. Right? Um, and here, this is a very nice, for people at home, what you're missing is a very nice uh, chart of the share of total population, which belongs to the least emitters and the highest emitters, um, and of, of the groups in between for uh, Russia and Central Asia, Asia um, Latin America, North America, and so on for different regions. Um, so it shows us that there are there can be middle classes in in, in certain regions, which we, uh, for example, the uh, middle class in China are there are lots of middle classes in, in China and and some in India, which are just as as high have a very high carbon consumption as well. 
and interesting that even the, the poorest in the United States in North America seem to have a really high carbon footprint here. Mm. So uh, just as a postscriptum, so it's not just protectionism, but also market creation that through carbon footprint policies that could evoke environmental justice concerns. For example, if you have maximum carbon thresholds for steel or hydrogen that could help to boost certain um, exports from the globe south, think of green hydrogen certification, uh, one could scrutinize the global distribution of work which results from that, which keeps the global south as an energy provider for the supposedly clean industries of the global north with conco concomitant environmental consequences in the global south because it also doesn't come for free or that hydrogen production. Uh, and one could think that the global south stays in this uh, position where they uh, just uh, are responsible for the raw material supply. Uh, but then it's not quite clear if a country like Brazil won't be able to catch up and produce green steel themselves. So I think it's also important to not just have this paternalistic vision that they are not going to be able to compete anyway or something like that. So, um, Just in summary, so maximum carbon thresholds or regulatory standards impose less on the global south than border carbon adjustments and are thus more in line with climate justice. The political economy of regulator, regulatory standards makes them more likely to result in high climate mitigation ambition than carbon pricing and border carbon adjustments. But regular standards can also be more directly used for protectionist purposes and are thus more problematic from a climate justice perspective. So I would say that there are some inherent tensions. So fully exploiting economic interests for ambitious climate policy and making low carbon tech widely available and achieving climate justice seems next to impossible. <laughs> but good ideas are welcome from you here and people at home. Thank you very, very much. And uh, thank you so much. Uh, really, it's fine. We'll talk um, certainly something that I know very little about, and um, I've learned a great deal today. Um, certainly extremely useful information. And we've got ample time for a thorough discussion. Um, shall I turn to the people in the room? Are there any immediate responses, any reflections, any questions? Need not, can come back later, still fine. Um, then um, let's go on to the people in the virtual domain. Um, if they are, perhaps could we unshare the screen, you know, perhaps we can even see the people. That would be great. If there's anyone just um, please ask a question or write it in. There we go. Or write it in the chat box and we'll be happy to deal with it. It's, it's, it's a, we actually only yeah. need to, after years of <laughs> teaching with COVID, I should be the absolute Zoom pro, it's <laughs> quite embarrassing. Doesn't matter, doesn't matter. There we go. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bernardo. Um, any specific questions from people in the virtual domain? Are there anyone with a hand up? Okay, so for now, I have a question. Um, and that is the involvement of corporations in all of this. I mean, there's now a lot of focus on the state and state regulation. And assuming that most of the sort of um, negotiations at the international level will happen at the interstate level, how would corporations, who in my view, are and will always remain some of the most influential, negative and hopefully positive um, forces on carbon and climate change more generally. How would 
or how could one imagine corporations becoming more actively involved within what you were saying here? Uh, are they involved in it? Could they make a positive contribution? Could they, could they, could they have a beneficial effect uh, on their practices? A corporate interstate corporation. Yes. So there are there are debates. I mean, this this whole a lot of this. Um, I didn't really go into this. A lot is kind of hidden in this idea of carbon clubs. Mm -hmm. is kind of potentially watered down versions. We have this idea of carbon club. It could be many things. It could be a joint tariff barrier, but it could also be border carbon adjustments. Uh, countries or countries accepting different countries accepting border carbon adjustments, having their own border carbon adjustments. It could also mean some cooperation in terms of thinking about what should be maximum thresholds in certain sectors. Now there is some there's some considerations of how to agree on common standards for something like green hydrogen. And if mm -hmm. you can do that, if you can track that, if you have a certain standard, then you can say, okay, this is the internationally agreed or agreed with certain party standard on green hydrogen. We will just say we will only accept imports of this type of hydrogen, mm -hmm. or we will only accept steel as green steel that was produced with that. So, and, and that makes a lot of sense to at least have those discussions. And also when it comes to, when it comes to WTO compliance, which is less important at the moment because the WTO is so blocked, but when it comes to compliance, it's very advisable to seek out the opinions of potentially affected parties anyway. So that is a, a mechanism where just just to make sure that they don't fall, 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 fall of these WTO rules, states have an interest in engaging in a kind of debate. But then the question is, how valuable is it when, when you engage in the debate, but you, your position is already fixed anyway, right? So, exactly. But yeah, potentially that's a, that's a big role for it. But why? My interest in these unilateral measures stems from very much from problems in achieving uh, multilateral, stronger multilateral measures, the, the failure of cooperation. And, and I mean, we've got the Paris Agreement, but it's, um, it's, it's not sufficient. And, and I, I think in order to, to ramp up the ambition level, it's very important to address carbon embodied in trade. And, and address those competitiveness issues um, because it's very difficult to have more ambitious climate policy just from a political economy perspective. Mm. Um, and, and there's a tension with, with climate justice. Yeah, of course. And perhaps just staying for a moment with the, with, the, with the sort of lack of international cooperation, if we just reflect on, um, you know, the climate cops that we have every single year, um, and uh, a lot of promise, very little happens. Um, and this is also something that I'm asking as a general sort of international lawyer. To what extent does the WE, uh, the WO, actually play a role within these larger sort of global climate negotiations? And if it does, do you think that there is perhaps a pathway to influence what you've been talking about in a positive way? The WTO. Mm. So, I mean, is there a sort of a, to make it more concrete, is there a very deliberate, or are we seeing a closer um, um, coming together between the work that the WTO does on the one hand, and on the other hand, the stuff that the, that the global climate institutions are doing? For example, the conferences of the parties. Yeah, I mean, there, there's definitely some i mean there's some some so i mean we've seen in, under the wto we've seen like this evolution of case law which makes it potentially but there's more hope that uh, discrimination based on production processes mm -hmm. and production based emissions abroad may uh, may may be accepted if it's not 
per se discriminatory. Mm. Um, that is really doesn't depend on where uh, something is produced, but just uh, about the carbon intensity. And then we've seen this proliferation of carbon footprint labels, environmental product declarations. We've seen um, ISO standardization processes, which would make it see see us less discriminatory and more business like. It's, it doesn't seem seem to be like okay, now we just come up with our own ideas, our own standards, and importers have to abide by those. But we say okay, there are those institutional processes in place. It's some accepted by by business that that there are those labels and there are those standards and so on. Mm-hmm. So I think that that has become easier. Um, there's also there are also lawyers arguing, for example, um, there's this article um, co-authored by by Dan Esty, who's now working with the WTO, and he's arguing that it's in the spirit of the, I think in, in the spirit of the Paris Agreement, even to have something like a border carbon adjustment. Um, it's kind of like a, a, a delegated way. I can't. I cannot entirely recall the argument now, but um, but it's that's basically because in the spirit of the Paris Paris Agreement, there is this kind of there's this multilateral sanctioning, and it should be there should be kind of a waiver of, of the WTO. It should kind of defer. WTO should defer to that. That sounds like something that Dan Isti would argue for. Yes, quite absolutely. Um, so I find it quite interesting to think about this. Okay, maybe we could think about that in terms of um, it would be interesting to think about whether we could extend this kind of thinking to um, the right of member states in the European Union or maybe to, to states in, in the United States uh, to lower level subnational actors to uh, impose their own regulations um, because they could also say, hey, it's in the spirit of the Paris Agreement, right? Mm-hmm. So I think that could be an interesting extension of that to mm-hmm. say, okay, mm. so you know that that wouldn't be in the interest of the common market, certainly not. But one could say, okay, this is still in the spirit of the Paris Agreement somehow, even though we talk about subnational actors and not national actors. Mm-hmm. Let's reflect just very briefly on something that you j- just touched on now: uh, these sort of regional groupings, also the EU. Um, just thinking now what happened a couple of weeks ago, the BRICS summit famously held in South Africa where Putin was invited and then he wasn't invited and then he was invited again and then he wasn't ultimately invited, um, or at least he didn't attend physically. Um, so that, of course, drew a lot of attention, not only because of, of the Ukraine conflict, but certainly also because of um, those arguing that we might see a sort of an emergence of a new global order and a new rebalancing rather of, of, the, of that order. So do you think that this new formation of BRICS, um, at least now and what it might become, do you think that that would have any sort of tangible destabilizing effect on what you've discussed here and the sort of what you've emphasized, you know, the northern dominance uh, and, the, and the, 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 the the typical sort of injustices that might arise from this dominance. Mm-hmm. So uh, do you think that there's any meaningful sort of potential of this new rebalancing act to upset the prevailing order? So I think these if you have this imposition of carbon standards, carbon pricing, and, and you use it with very protectionist intent or it's being interpreted as, as such, um, it can become part of this, can can become a part of this fracturing of the of the global trade order and this kind of maybe a bifurcation or like a splitting in different trade blocks. Um, so it could could be become part and parcel of that, not necessarily as a cause, but it could be a way of saying, well, we're doing this for climate reasons, but really to protect the European car industry, for example. And it could be part of this um, d- d- disconnection of this um, 
um, separation, separation of these uh, in, in spheres of trade, spheres of influence, and so on. Um, it, it could become part and parcel of that, um, and I think that's that, that's also another reason why it's important to to look at the environmental justice dimension here, because it also confers legit legitimacy on climate policy, and, and I think people will try to discredit climate policy um, with that, saying this is just protectionist intent, this is not fair, and so on. And it might at times not be fair, but I think there's a real danger that you have this, that on the one hand, uh, industrial laggards or dirty industries from the global north will, will use that narrative or oh, those policies are, are not just to just protect their their conventional, their standard ways of doing things, mm. but also that that you will also have similar critique from 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 other countries, uh, perhaps also from from BRICS countries, who, and this could play into and wider geopolitical rifts. Of course, that makes sense. Thank you. And, and and ultimately, if that was the case, that would undermine the the effectiveness of those yeah. projects tremendously. Yeah, quite. Quite makes sense. Um, any other issues that have arisen here on the floor, perhaps? Julie? Um, it's Please. a little different from what you were talking about, but in terms of climate justice, they have the climate fund, the billions or trillions or however much <laughs> Mark and what's his thing, the Bank of England guy. Um, how does that fit in with what you are working on in terms of trying to um, trying to um, I guess quantify the the benefits as well as the um, uh, burdens on the global south because the climate fund is supposed to be for the poor countries, right? So, um, how does that fit in? How is it? How is it working? What is your view on the future of it? Because the last I heard, it was kind of falling apart. Like they weren't getting the money that they were anticipating. Mm -hmm. But if they were still to get some money. Could it go towards some of the work that you're talking about in terms of um, you have uh, mm -hmm. single industries that are trying to lower the carbon emissions in across the world? So could you give could some of that climate fund money be used in the global south to help them clean up certain industries? It would, and it's kind of a roaming question, but yeah, I mean, I, I didn't uh, include it. Stu. That's a that's a really Good question. I I didn't really include this notion of technology transfer mm. here because I think it's that's in, in a way because that's kind of a standard answer of how you make this just. Oh, okay. uh, but it seems so hollow to repeat it again and again because there isn't there hasn't been much materializing. Okay. And so obviously this climate finance. Or technology transfer could be another option rather than just waiting for transnational corporations and their foreign direct investments to to spread the new technologies. That could be the op that could be an option, and to think more about uh, models how the public money could stay in the public sphere and could be used for scaling this up, uh, for scaling up the technology diffusion around the globe and and to make the global south. Uh, to to allow them a, a low carbon industrialization, mm -hmm. um, but the the question is how to, to what extent would would industry in the global north benefit from nourishing those competitors, and what, how how is this money going to materialize and 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 going to be spent? Uh, so I, I think it would be great, and we should be we should be pursuing that. Mm -hmm. But it would also lower the interest of industry in the global north to actually um, would also lower somewhat lower their interest because they would get less benefit when it's industry um, specific like that. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So, what do you see as the future of the the climate fund? Then, do you see it actually succeeding or going anywhere? Like, um, I, I haven't read a lot lately. I'm just curious. I'm not an expert on it. I think we have. Uh, Another expert, one of the fellows, an expert on uh, Global Climate Fund, right? That could be, yes. Thomas, I think. Yes. Oh, okay. 
Good. So, um, any other questions? Anyone online? No? Good. So then, please allow me to thank you again for your time and for the wonderful presentation. Thank you to all of those of you who have attended online. Thank you for those who have been here in person on a beautiful, beautiful late summer day. So now we all release and we wish you a wonderful um, afternoon further. Please go out in the sun and enjoy it. Uh, Nino, thanks again. And we'll be in touch uh, in due course about our future events. Have a lovely day, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thanks.